Hello and welcome to this edition of International Economic Crash Course, broadcasting from Hanoi, Vietnam. I'm Chen Nguyen with the headline. And this week we will talk about is that industrial 4.0? How does that term came up and what can it can do for Vietnam? Let's find out this time. Enjoy. According to some experts, we're at the beginning of a fourth industrial revolution, and it's one that'll make those that came before it look like mere dress rehearsals for the main event. But what is it and why should you care? Sometimes it seems that human history has been one big continuous technological roller coaster ride. First we discovered fire and then agriculture, then came the wheel and then cities and manufacturing and trading, followed by steam power, electricity, mass production, synthetic chemicals, computers, the internet, gene editing, blockchain, self-driving cars, artificial intelligence. Scientists are now even talking about growing people in laboratories and one day possibly downloading our brains into computers. This is one mind-blowingly crazy technological roller coaster ride we're on, and it's getting faster and weirder by the day. If you're into tech, of course, this is an incredibly exhilarating ride, but it's also a scary one, especially when you think about what might go wrong. Over the past 300 years, one wave after another of technological revolutions have impacted our lives. It started with the first industrial revolution when we discovered how to fully harness the power of steam. Then as we entered the 20th century, we worked out how to mass produce products using electricity. This led to a second industrial revolution that lasted all the way up to the 1970s when we discovered digital computers. And then we found ourselves in yet another revolution. But now we're going through a fourth industrial revolution, and it's one that's so radical, it makes the previous three look like child's play. What makes this fourth industrial revolution so different is that we're well on the way to developing the ability to design and engineer the world around us using the very atoms and molecules it's made of. If you think of atoms and how they're arranged in materials as the digital code of the real world, we're learning how to hack this code and in the process to change our reality. You can see this in areas like gene editing and synthetic biology, where we are quite literally learning how to hack biology by reprogramming DNA. But we're also learning to hack stuff that isn't alive by using atoms and molecules in new ways. Using nanotechnology and other forms of advanced manufacturing, for instance, we're creating designer materials that can be used in everything from our clothes and our computers to robots, a spacecraft, even the food we eat. But this isn't the half of it. What makes this fourth industrial revolution so mind-boggling is the way that we're vastly enhancing this mastery of living and non-living stuff with an incredibly powerful secret source. And this secret source is cyberspace. In the third industrial revolution we discovered digital computing and we created a virtual world of bits and bytes and we're now quite literally using this to add a fifth dimension to the world we live in. Of course we're all familiar with the three physical dimensions up, down, left, right and front, back and we're used to thinking of time as a fourth dimension but cyberspace allows us to work outside of these more conventional dimensions and dip in and out of them at will. In other words, cyberspace provides us with a back door to re-engineering and redesigning our reality. It's a bit like the science fiction idea of hyperspace in that it gives us ways to achieve things in the real world that would be impossible if we couldn't sometimes step outside of it. This is really mind-blowing stuff, but it's also a little disquieting because we're in completely uncharted territory and we have remarkably little idea of what might go wrong. Of course we have some hints. We know, for instance, that we're now at a point where if a technology gets out of hand, we can't simply turn the clock back. There is no easy reset button when you're hacking reality. And we realize that if we're not careful, a lot of people could get hurt in this fourth industrial revolution by losing their jobs, for instance, or their rights, or even their lives. Even more worryingly, perhaps, we're beginning to develop artificial intelligences that live in cyberspace and that we don't fully understand or control. What's even more concerning is that just as we can use cyberspace to hack reality, so can they. This could get weird fast if we're not careful, and this is why 
everyone should care about the fourth industrial revolution and where it's taking us. Because unless we learn how to develop and use our new technological capabilities responsibly, this could end up being one roller coaster ride of a revolution that, for some people, leaves the rails with catastrophic consequences. The fourth industrial revolution is here. Technologies like analytics and artificial intelligence are blurring the lines between our physical and digital worlds. This revolution is transforming industries, economies and even society itself. But are business and government leaders prepared to harness the full potential of this era of Industry 4.0 in a way that benefits both industries and society? Deloitte joined forces with Forbes Insights to find out. We surveyed more than 1,600 C-level executives worldwide and uncovered several significant findings. First, two out of three executives surveyed say businesses will have a greater influence in shaping the future of society than governments and other groups like NGOs and not-for-profits. But that sentiment doesn't extend to themselves personally. Less than a quarter believe they, or their own organization, have significant influence over social factors like education, sustainability, and social mobility. Second, only 14% of executives surveyed are highly confident their organization can effectively leverage the changes brought about by Industry 4.0. But this lack of confidence has not compelled executives to change their tactics. Many continue to focus on traditional, short-term business operations over longer-term strategies that create new value. Third, only a quarter of executives are highly confident they have the right workforce and skill sets needed for future success. But, talent and HR continue to be low priorities within their organizations, even though 86% say they are doing everything they can to create a better prepared workforce. Finally, Executives believe one of the biggest threats to their business over the next five years is new business models introduced by competitors. Therefore, it's understandable that one of the top considerations for companies when investing in advanced technologies is if they can support new business models to help them create, deliver and capture value. There is little doubt Industry 4.0 will create exciting new opportunities. Those who take a broad view will be the ones to succeed in this new era. They will see connections between business and social needs, between financial outcomes and innovative strategies, between worker productivity and a changing workforce, and between improving operations and creating new value. The fourth industrial revolution has arrived. Are you ready? We have removed some of the explanation about the industrial industrialization for point out. And up next in our cross talk, we will talk about Vietnam and the fourth industrial revolution. So to have 50 million telephone users worldwide took 75 years. For radio it was 38 years. And yep, the internet only need four years and Facebook is even faster, only 3.5 years. This was thanks to the, to the technological innovation and breakthroughs across multiple sectors, which is one of the core elements of the fourth industrial revolution. To have a better understanding of how Vietnam can get most of out of the industrial revolution, we will have a talk with Leo Wing, CEO of, the, of Nagen, an information technology company. Hello and thank you very much for joining us today. So recently, you know, uh, Industry 4.0 has been mentioned in a lot of discussion session, and there are several uh, definitions of Industry 4.0 already. Uh, as an industry insider, what's your definition of Industry 4.0? All I can say is that we are in a period of incredible technology development, and the rate and the velocity and the penetration of technology um, is you know, so much that I think that people, you know, different people are going to try to have different uh, definition for it. Um, if you want to have a kind of like a simple, how say it, um, understanding, and we can say that the, the greatest, um, you know, 3.0 is all about computing, right? So computer, personal computer, um, and that my company like Microsoft. And then, you know, 30 years ago, when I first touched a computer, is something fixed 
and you have a lot of kind of like um, um, admiration for a piece of equipment. But today, everybody have a computer, um, you know, on their hand, you know, which is the mobile phone. And you can think of, you know, the so-called 4.0 is we have computing power everywhere. You know, the fact that we have enormous or maybe we can say infinite computing power. And a lot of people say it's going to even have a, so much impact on how we can, you know, exist as human beings. So, in your opinion, what led to Industry 4.0? What led to the today mobile expo uh, explosion and also lead to the, you know, um, uh, computing everywhere, lead to artificial intelligence, lead to robotics, lead to so much technology innovation, is the fact that computing power become increasingly cheaper because of something called more law. So if you uh, basically what more law saying is that um, back in the year 1960, 1960 when Moore is one of the founder of Intel, and he basically um, you know come up with observation saying that computing power is gonna be double and half in cost every 18 months. So take an example, the, f um, the first computer that put um, the human on, on the moon, basically used by NASA to calculate all these tra tra trajectory for the NASA astronauts to go to the moon, is, you know, um, cost a, few, you know, a lot of money, I mean millions of US dollars, and its ability is, I think, one-tenth of maybe a lot less than the iPhone that you hold in your hand. Imagine this rate going to continue to increase over the next 10 or 20 years. So many of the things that we, you know, cannot think of, and we think that is like, you know, um, unimaginable, going to become very, very common in the next 10 or 20 years. And that is all about like, you know, what the so-called industry 4.0 is all about. You just talk about the dramatic change uh, as a direct result of Industry 4.0 in different fields. How about the change you witnessed uh, in uh, information technology? When you're looking at like the U.S. today, right? The biggest company, uh, Apple, the one that makes iPhone, Microsoft, the one that makes all what we call the productivity software, so for all the office in the world to use, Facebook the one that makes social network for all the consumer to connect and social, you know, you know to, to create social connection with each other. Google, right? Um, Amazon. So increasingly, you see IT company becoming dominating the whole economy. So they, they, they developed like 40 years ago and now they're the biggest in the world. And they continue to grow at a much faster rate compared to all the traditional company. Um, you can be surprised to really understand that, um, you know, I think more than 90% of all the trading in Wall Street right now is done by computer, not by human anymore. The real IT company is dominating, uh, you know, uh, the world. And then all the other company will need to become an IT company. So I think like, you know, in Maybe in, in 20 years, there will be no longer a distinction between IT company and, and other company. Everybody is an IT company. The fourth industrial revolution is a big opportunity for Vietnam to accelerate the process of industrialization and modernization towards its goals of becoming a modern industrial country. However, it also poses challenges for the industrial workforce. This machine is twice as productive as a normal worker. Meanwhile, it takes only one year to earn back the capital investment for the machine. Aside from boosting automated production, this textile firm also started digitizing processes, including designing, producing and delivering products. Ở đây không phải là tác động mà nó sẽ quyết định cái sự tồn tại hay không tồn tại của doanh nghiệp. Cho nên tất cả các doanh nghiệp của chúng ta in contrast to potential job losses in certain industries, the information technology industry in Vietnam is witnessing a shortage of human resources. It is estimated that demand for recruitment has increased steadily by nearly 50% annually.
while only 8% of graduate students can meet the demand of employers. Đến năm 2020 thì Việt Nam sẽ thiếu khoảng chừng 100.000 ứng viên ngành công nghệ thông tin. Chúng ta không có cái đội ngũ đủ giỏi thì những cơ hội nó vẫn sẽ chỉ là cơ hội thôi. Experts have also showed concern due to the trend of investors returning their investment to the US. Meanwhile, the sports brand Adidas also plan to build a factory in Germany, no longer in a low-wage country. So what is your forecast of the role of human being in the Industry 4.0 era, where a lot of jobs will be replaced by machine? In the, um, you know, in the computing and technology field, there's a lot of debate about it. You know, so we create a uh, mechanical tool to help with our physical ability, so like all the machine. Uh, we create the computers and phones and communication technology to help increasing our ability to calculate or to communicate. Thinking is the final ability that you know, the machine right now cannot do. But if they're able to do the thinking, and then you know, once the machine doing the thinking, they can have what they call infinitely smarter than the, the human. Then, then normally, you know, according to evolution theory, then we'll be replaced. That is the pessimistic uh, feel. The optimistic saying like, you know, um, you know um, um, we, we always have the ability to outthink the computer. So, uh, or, or we can control it uh, because we are the creator. So we can control it and, and make the computer to work for us instead of replacing us. And you know what is the most popular job in the US right now? Truck driver. And I would so believe that in the next 20 years, all those truck driver will be gone because you know, truck will sell, drive itself. What those truck driver gonna become? I don't know. You know, hopefully the market mechanism going to be able to kind of like, you know, retrench some of them. So you just said about the unprecedented technology that we've never seen before. So with that, we can empower the little giants, right? The opportunity is a lot bigger. You know, um, taking an interesting example, uh, Flappy Bird, which is like, you know, a lot of the Vietnamese, um, they're really proud of. So. 10 years or even 15 years ago in the PC age, to have a single Vietnamese developers creating a product for 100 million users in the world to use on PC, it's going to be impossible. It's impossible because number one, um, you know, even, even we can have a genius creating something that 100 million won, it's impossible for us to distribute those software to 100 million people. Right now, because of the mobile phone, because of App Store, because of the, un, uh, like, you know, right now all the distribution is digitalized. It's no longer physical distribution. Big companies, they have a disadvantage because they being stuck a lot in their, what they call existing business, right? And then if you're stuck in existing business, it's very hard for you to pursue new things. And small startups, small companies, or new company, um, they can pursue the new ideas, new innovation, and they capture opportunity and becoming, you know, and grows very big in a very short time. Facebook is, you know, a company with, with about 13 years old, so it's not so 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 young or so small, but they grow tremendously because of mobile. We in the technology industry really at night, Facebook is. You know, not just because of the size, but because it is one company that relentlessly pursuing the future technology. So given all the opportunities that you just mentioned, can Vietnam companies leverage the advantages of Industry 4.0? People often say that because Vietnam is, um, you know, going, um, you know, can capture new opportunity, jump on the, 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 the new technology trend and creating new product. So that in theory is yes, but in reality, how can you do it? It's like, you know, you're building a house. You cannot just build it on dreams and ideas. You need to have capability. You need to have, you know, the foundation. You need to have, the, uh, you know, all these resources so that you can build a big and kind of like, you know, tall buildings, right? 
So talking about what is the foundation, and you're looking at you know all these company that the you know prime example of industry 4.0, the Google, the Facebook, the Microsoft, the Uber of the world, right? they normally are all come from established countries like U.S. and now increasingly China. They have a big market so that one innovation can you know get a lot of attention in terms of capital investment and one and and bring that innovation idea to commercialization in a very kind of like you know um, ex effective way you know we how we can create environment and the foundation so that you know small company or uh, startup in vietnam can really be able to scale and capture the, tech, the new technology trend and creating, you know, really significant value is still, still a question that, you know, I, I don't really have an answer. And the optimistic part is, you know, okay, you know, we are young and we are enthusiastic and we support to be smart, so hopefully we can, we can do something. So do you mean that Vietnam needs to put more effort in building an ecosystem for companies to grow in Industry 4.0? And, and it's a very good sign that government and a lot of government bodies talk about like, you know, let's create a, you know, this startup environment, let's promote startup, let's promote entrepreneur. But translating that to real policy, translating that to result, going to take effort from many different bodies, you know, not just the top. And that effort will have to be consistent over a long period of time. Small, young company don't have a lot of resources you know, created by technology people who don't normally have a business skill. Another big area is the education. The number of people and the quality of, you know, undergraduate that coming out from university in Vietnam that can, you know, uh, programming uh, is relatively very small to the scale of Vietnam. So, you know, you're talking about India. India every year have about uh, more than 150,000 to 200,000 people um, who graduate on good skill set of IT programming. Vietnam, uh, less than 10,000. The gap is big. Right? So education, there's still a lot of, um, you know, um, a lot of effort, as, you know, not, not, not on a territory kind of like, you know, level, but on, I think, on the um, university and um, kind of like skill development. Technology innovations have paved the way for sharing economy business models such as Uber or Grab services, which are getting more and more popular in Vietnam. As a rule, taxi cabs must have lights, numbers and verified meters. Taxi businesses must have a minimum number of cabs. However, according to Uber representatives, these regulations cannot be applied to ride-sharing services like Uber or Grab. Ride-sharing and Uber and Grab are different to something like taxi. They're offering something different. In the past, you used to have regulations on taxi to ensure for things like safety. So there was a number on the taxi, there was a light. According to Uber's report, today, ride-sharing apps account for less than 4% of all kilometers driven globally. But this will rise to more than 25% by 2030. Experts say that for new economic models, regulators have two approaches. Firstly, making sure the new model adheres to current regulations. Secondly, is loosening old rules if tightening them is not feasible. Cũng giống như ta phải dọn dẹp cái tủ quần áo để để bỏ những cái cái món đồ lỗi mốt đi, thì các cơ quan quản lý nhà nước cũng phải dọn dẹp, cũng phải ra soát lại các cái hệ thống quy phạm pháp luật. According to a representative of the Ministry of Industry and Trade, the sharing economy will have leveraged idle resources of individuals. The model is also contributing to boosting economic growth and applying science and technology. For this reason, there is a need for the change in the way management responds to these models as well as to better adapt to the fourth industrial revolution. As an IT company doing business in Vietnam with the aim of going global as well, uh, what can VNG benefit from Industry 4.0? So the first thing we have is we pretty scared. We have to create products, right? Create product and create new technology. 
I mean, not, not necessarily of we have to come up with technology that so new, like, you know, we have to invent new things, but how to bring the ideas of new technology and translate them to kind of like practical, you know, use in Vietnam. Um, take, for example, um, Zalo, which is our mobile messaging, um, right? So, you know, it's, it's just a simple idea. It's, it's basically mobile messaging. You create a software on mobile phones so that people can communicate with each other. But under, underlying that is a lot of technology that we have to use and learn, and right, you know, not just like, you know, I'm creating kind of like data, uh, um, uh, um, data storage and management and processing for millions and millions of people communicating with each other. Uh, people say that in every difficulty, there's a seed of opportunity. So where's the seed of opportunity in uh, the case of VNG here? I think that the challenge of us facing is also a challenge of a lot of Vietnamese companies, you know, whether you're IT company or not, is how to find the resource that really be able to understand and develop all these complicated technology or complex or advanced technologies and apply it into environment like Vietnam. We are still talking about like how to put together the first AI group within VNG, and uh, we do it in a very kind of like simple way. Um, so for us right now, it's still a lot of experimentation, understanding the technology, and hopefully in the next few years, then we can translate those understanding into practical products. Today, you're looking at companies in Vietnam. The biggest one is the real estate company, is the banks is the, uh, you know, I don't know, consumer good company. We hope that in 10 year time, the biggest company is going to be IT company. I mean, you know, that trend is inevitable. Hopefully, those IT companies are going to be Vietnamese, you know, because, you know, if, if Vietnamese company cannot, you know, capture this technology wave, then all the people are going to do it. So hopefully, we, 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 we're going to continue our, uh, to, to, to our, our journey to solve those kind of questions and, and, you know, you know, reap some opportunity and values in the future. Thank you very much for your insights into the industry 4.0 and good luck with your journey of going global. Thank you. We have found that Vietnamese organizations expect significant benefits from Industry 4.0, such as improving operational efficiency and improved access to customers. These impacts are already affecting some local organizations and others anticipate their impacts in the near future as well. So one of the very interesting findings is that most respondents actually do know about Industry 4.0, but beyond that, not many really understand what were the concepts involved and what were the impacts. And despite these uncertainties, most of them were actually really looking forward to it and expected a lot of benefits from it personally. Globally, Respondents are more concerned about getting senior management buy-in and determining the return of investments. Meanwhile in Vietnam, respondents worry more about the lack of digital standards, insufficient skills in the local market and data security and privacy. So when asked about what they expect to spend, I think many companies in Vietnam indicated that they were spending quite a lot on digitization and automation. So right now as it stands, they're really spending around 9% of annual revenue and they expect the figure to reach about 22% within the next 5 years. And if you think about it, it's considered quite a massive amount of money that they expect to spend. Many respondents lack clarity on the specific skills knowledge and capabilities required to make digital integration a reality in Vietnam. Core capabilities required for the industrial revolution, such as data analytics, are also lacking. So the big question here is, who needs to take the lead to bring Vietnam into the new digital environment? I think most respondents indicated that private business needs to take the lead. Uh, but that said, um, there is a place for government to be involved to make sure that the transition for Vietnam is done well. It points towards a need for a lot of public-private partnerships to make sure that this collaboration works. Okay. In the context of the fourth industrial revolution, Vietnam 
have to tackle challenges such as job loss due to the developing of technologies as well as the lack of workers in certain areas such as IT. However, with the young and tech-savvy population as well as the commi commitment from the government, um, experts have high hopes that Vietnam can take advantage of these um, revolutions and um, develop the social and, eco and economic of the countries even further. And that also wraps up this edition for us. Thank you for watching.